Welcome to Community Roundtable. I'm Nick Burns from the Salt Lake Community College Division of Communication and Performing Arts, and I'm your host as we explore topics of special interest and special concern to the residents of the cities and the unincorporated areas of Salt Lake County. And these are topics that we feel are equally important to the general public throughout all of Utah. Today on Community Roundtable, we welcome the longest serving legislator on Capitol Hill. He served in the House and now continues his career in the Senate. He represents District 25, that's the folks way up north. He sits on multiple appropriations committees, the, Senate's, the Senate rather Ethics Committee, and many more. And when he's not on the Hill, he is the president of his own law firm. Senator Lyle Hilliard, welcome. Glad to be here, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So let's jump in. North Cache High School, USU, U Law School, president of Hilliard, Anderson, and Olson. So it's not like you don't have stuff going on, and yet you're the longest serving legislator we've got. So why politics? What took you there? Well, I really started in high school. I okay. enjoyed politics in high school and got involved, and, and then I've been involved in the county level for some time. I was chairman of the Young Republicans in Cache County. I ended up as chairman of the Republican Party in Cache County. Okay. And then I basically got out of politics because we were blessed in our life with a son with disabilities, and his health was really pretty fragile for a number of years. He's now still alive. He's 40 years old. Wow. Doing very well. But when he got more stable than the current senator at the time, Charles Bullen, contacted me and said he was not going to run. And so he thought I'd make a good senator. So as I got ready to file, he called me the night before and said he'd decide to run again. So I said, I'm not going to run against you. But the people I had geared up said, let's go for the House. So okay. they did for the House. I served there two terms or four years. Chick, my good friend, came back to me and he says, this time I really am not going to run again. So I then ran for the Senate, and that's where I've been. For a long time. Yeah, yeah. 30, I've been in the Senate 32 years. This will be my 32nd year, but the legislature 36. So over 30 years in the Senate, that does give you the record? Well, no, the record is actually held by two. One, one is Senator Haven Barlow. He was there for 42 years. Wow. And right behind him was Senator Mike Dimitri, a Democrat from Price. I think Mike was there 40 or 41 years. It was a long years. time. Yeah. But currently... I currently, I'm the, I'm the longest serving one up there. Okay, so I got a list here. Executive Appropriations, the Senate Chair, Infrastructure and General Government Appropriations Subcommittee, Public Education Appropriations Subcommittee, Ethics Committee, Government Operations Political, Sub, uh, Political Subdivisions Committee, Senate Judiciary, Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice. I mean, I want to joke that nobody writes a check without your sign off. <laughs> I wish. No, uh, we do approve it. it, it Utah is really interesting because every legislator, Republican, Democrat, serve on one of our eight subcommittees on appropriations. Okay. So I happen to serve on infrastructure and on public ed because there's less senators than our House members. But on that same committee, we have Republicans and Democrats, senators and House people, and they put together their budget for that subcommittee. When that subcommittee gets through, they meet before the committee I chair executive appropriations, and we make the final allocations. I've been doing this, this will be my 12th year, and we've been really pretty faithful in letting committees set the priorities. And I think the committees have okay. appreciated that and stepped forward. I've been there in years when you do your appropriations and go to executive appropriation, they just chop them up and do whatever they wanted. Uh, but we've been pretty loyal to our committees, and I think they've really appreciated it. I mean, that, I would think that would work both ways. You can you can breed loyalty back to you by respecting what those subcommittees come up with as well, right? Well, we could, but I think it's loyalty to the process. I okay. think people appreciate, appreciate that. I tell them, I, I will let you know what's in your budget, because sometimes we have to put things in. It's just the political nature. The governor wants something that has not been approved by the committee, or there's other priorities that come to us at the last, yeah. we have to put it together. But I would dare say 80% of our budget is put together by the committees through the opening process, and people testify and hear the votes and do all of that. Okay. So when it comes to revenue, there seems to be a lot of confusion that on the one hand, there's ongoing funds, things that happen every year, and then there's a whole different pot of money that's, here's money we have right now and we won't have it again. <laughs> so how do you wrangle the differences between those two, I guess I want to say, pots of money? Let me tell you how we do it, and I'm going to try to cut down a two-hour discussion okay. in two minutes. 
uh, our fiscal year ends June 30th. So on June 30th of 2015, we knew how much money we had either gone in the hole, and of course we can't, we have to cover it, but we knew what the surpluses were. Mm -hmm. We ended up, after doing all that back and forth, with roughly now $45 million of savings in the bank that we had at the end of June 30th. That's all education money. So the only way it can be spent is on education things, and it's one-time money because it was in the savings amount. Now as we start the session, we'll look at the fiscal year we're currently in, which is fiscal year 16. Starts on July 1st of 15, ends on June 30th. Our people will look back at the figures again and they'll come to us and say, ooh, ooh things are not going as well as we thought, or they're going better, and they'll give us where we are now with those budget figures for this fiscal year. Assume for a minute they come back and say, things are doing pretty well, and we think we've got an extra $80 million. We then take that, again as one-time money, because it'll be in our base budget, We we put together and we set that aside as one-time money for both of those. Then our same fiscal analyst people look at what they think the revenue is going to be for the next 18 months. Okay. From July 1st through June 30th of 2017. Okay. And they come back to us and say we think income tax will increase this, sales tax this, or decrease whatever it is, and they give us figures. Another unique thing about Utah is the governor does his budget figures we do our budget figures and we come together and have consensus figures. So on December the 7th of this year, you'll hear a consensus figure given and it'll be the one-time money I've talked about and the ongoing money. So when we meet at the end of January, we know what we have to work with. Then about the middle of February, near the end of February, we have that all updated because all the income tax you collect for Christmas is, goes through to the end of December, but is paid by the end of January. You pay it one month late. So we'll have that figures in, and that's our final figure. And that's what you can budget from. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that's confusing to some people, though, I think, that one-time money isn't something you can spend more than once. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because we may have, say, for example, $200 million of ongoing and $300 million of one-time, and I'll pick up the paper and they'll say, oh, they've got $500 million. And I say, well, well the $200 mm -hmm. million is what I really... That's what I really can build a budget on. Secondly, Utah by Constitution requires all income tax money to be spent on public and higher education. So like this surplus we have now of $45 million, that's education money. We can only spend it on education matters. I know I saw a, an email or a tweet the other day that said, oh, we ought to spend on Medicaid. Can't. It's, right. Uh, it's general fund is our lifeblood for state government. And if it's one-time money, you can't hire teachers with it because right. that would be ongoing. You could, what, build a school... Uh, buy iPads, I mean, I don't know what, yeah. books, yeah. right? But something that you can only spend once. So again, to me, that gets confusing for some people. What typically happens with that kind of money is we use it in higher education. Oh, good. So your buildings are built here. Uh-huh. Uh, usually from that one-time money, and it avoids bonding. Okay. So, very good. Um, you mentioned public education, these exec executive appropriations, there's infrastructure, all the roads and things we talk about. I wonder when you hear from constituents, you know, not only up north in, in your neck of the woods, but from around the states, what generates the most buzz? I mean, what do people tend to care the most about? Well, it's really interesting because a lot of people haven't made the connection that the only way I get money to spend is if I take it away from somebody. I have to raise taxes, I have to take it for another agency. So quite often people will talk to me about giving them more money, but never willing to increase the taxes. <laughs> I saw a great quote from the House when they decided not to expand Medicaid. It said basically, everybody wants to expand Medicaid, but nobody wants to pay for it. And that's the, that's the disconnect that I have to connect as I visit with people to say, I have a limited, this is what I have. Now the only way I can get any more is take it away from somebody or either taxes or from some other agency. Well, and I can imagine nobody really wants to give anything up. Right? I have That's met one agent. I have not met one agent yet who's come forward and said, "Oh, we've got too much money." We've got too. Yeah, go yeah. ahead and do something else with this. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about the changes you've seen in the Senate over your years okay. there. And speaking of Medicaid, we're going to have to get into that at some point. So I'll, I'll ask to. you about that. We'll be back on Community Roundtable talking with Senator Lyle Hilliard. Keep it tuned. We'll be right back. We are back on Community Roundtable. Thank you for joining us, talking with Senator Lyle Hilliard. So we left off talking about um, how revenue works, how appropriations work, and you've been around long enough, I'm guessing there's a whole lot more zeros on the budgets <laughs> these days? I love to tell this story. I was in leadership of the House when Norm Bangeter was a speaker. 
Governor Matheson was the governor, and I listened to him arguing back and forth because Governor Matheson did not want to be the first governor with a $1 billion budget. So we worked out some uh, some of the funding things so that we still got it funded, but it did not show as a $1 billion budget. I've been up there years when we've had $1.6 billion of new revenue. Yeah. We're at $15 billion now. So that was in 83 to now. But I mean, the Salt Palace, the Olympics, immigration, the influx and the growth of the yeah. population. We're talking about a lot of changes. And I wonder, what have you seen in the Senate? I mean, there's so much discussion nationally about sort of the ill will and the rancor and the rigidity of politicians. What do you see changed here in Utah? Let me tell you, uh, I can't speak for the House because I'm not over there enough. But in the Senate, there is no rancor. I take some pride in the fact that I've done the budget now for 11 years and it's passed unanimously in the Senate. The Democrats and Republicans have voted together and I think it's part of the, the program that we have that everybody's involved in it. Everyone knows that the problem with that is they become advocates. So if you're on the higher ed committee, you come to me and say, well, higher ed needs more money. And I say, well, what about, I know oh, higher ed needs more money. But so we don't have the rancor. Uh, we hmm. don't have the feelings in the, in the Senate. Uh, House, I don't think is, is bad if they, if they have any, but we get along really pretty well. I think there's two things that have changed most dramatically to me. Number one is the growth of the lobbying industry. When I was up there 36 years ago, there were very few contract lobbyists. There were lobbyists, for example, for the University of Utah. There's a lobbyist from Utah Power and Light, or these, and they can. And they're very helpful because as a legislator in 45 days, there's no way you can know everything you need to know. So the lobbyists are very helpful. Now there are so many lo there are so many lobbyists up there that um, some are former legislators, uh, other people involved. That, it, that really, I wish that at some point we could say, whoa. Uh, you know, we, we need 10 or 15, but we don't need the punch number. <laughs> so. 10, 10 is enough? <laughs> what would you do? What, what would you do about that in terms of an electoral process and getting people well informed? Anything could be done? I don't think there really is anything you can really do on it because, number one, our agendas are much more compact. There's so much hmm. going on and, and uh, s so much money relying on it that people now have their own lobbyists are up there working in there. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like I can talk to lobbyists. I feel very comfortable. But if I tell them no, I tell them no. And I think sometimes lobbyists can be very, very smooth talking. So suddenly you think they're, they're your very best friends in the whole world. Well, of course they are, <laughs> right? But I mean, if, if the number of lobbyists is growing, the amount of minutes you can devote to each lobbyist must be shrinking. Well, I mean, they're <laughs> uh, they come to me plenty, but I, I, I'm sure it is. They have to have some way they, they make contact. And I don't know. I have no intent or desire to be a lobbyist, but I, but I think that's a change. I think the other thing that's changed is social media. Hmm. I remember when we first started putting our bills online, I had a bill involving snowmobiles. And I got an email from Vernal telling me that a word I'd used in my bill was the wrong word. I took it to our staff and said, look what I got. And they came back and said, they are dead right. So I, I changed the bill. I got an email from them the next day saying thank you. Huh. And so it used to be all you knew about what was in the legislature, you pick up the Tribune or the Desert News. They usually only had the bills by short title, so you really didn't know what they were. Now anybody can listen to our committee meetings, can read our bills and do all of that. That's good. The bad thing is the other day I was in a committee and the discussion was about the gang problem here in Salt Lake. I can't even remember what comment I made. I just asked a question. Then I certainly started Twitter. Somebody in that meeting was tweeting that I hated Hispanics. I said, what? I turned to my good friend Gene Davis, who's the minority leader in the Senate, and I said, Gene, did I say anything of this? He says, no. So you get those, that kind of a social media going on, mm -hmm. and there's no way you can respond to it. It's just out there. And I, I think that's what, what we have to be careful. I, I know the Herald Journal the, the other day indicated they were not going to print uh, so much of their stuff anonymously, because people with anonymous comments are just saying terrible things. There's plenty of trolling, yeah. plenty of trolls going on. So you don't want to have your own Twitter feed and <laughs> I, keep up on your own? I have a Twitter See? account, and I do all of that, but I don't think you find anything there that would be embarrassing to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one thing that struck me looking over your legislative career was you won an award from the American Cancer Society Legislator of the Year. I suspect you don't smoke or I maybe you smoke. quit. So oh, what did you have. win that for? Well, uh, they came to us with a funding 
it was from the tobacco tax, and we were changing, okay. the, the, and they needed some money from the tobacco tax to go directly to their research. See, we were very careful, at least we tried to be very careful with tobacco tax money to make sure it goes into treatment, secession programs, mm -hmm. uh, cancer programs, and this, and they were so pleased that we were able to help them somewhat in their in their drive to eliminate cancer. That's part of the settlement, right, with the tobacco mm -hmm. companies, yeah. all the states got some money. Yeah. Okay, well, congratulations. Oh, thank I can you. think of plenty of worse wars that many <laughs> politicians have won. Um, speaking of change over the last decades, the relationship between Utah and the federal government seems very different than 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Yes, no, maybe? You're absolutely right, and I think part of it, I go to a number of national meetings because of my experience, and I find what we have here in Utah is pretty general in every state. I think there's really a frustration that the thing, pe people are doing things back in Washington without our input, without our suggestion. I was working on a bill, I'm a commissioner for uniform laws, we were doing a, a uniform law to allow overseas voters to vote in elections. And we, I think, had it worked out that with states, suddenly, I think Senator Schumer, Schumer put it in an appropriations bill that came through Utah, and it didn't fit us at all. We've had to really make some adjustments. And for example, mm -hmm. when we have our caucus meetings, when we have our primaries, all of that maybe fit well on a broad screen, but it didn't work well with Utah. So we really had to make some adjustments to make that work. That's the frustration, is that Washington seems to be acting without really seeing what the real impact on the ground is. And that's where state legislators, I think, have a better tie. Too big, too big a gap. Too, too big, big a distance. Gap, yeah. Even with our elected folks there. Even with ours, uh, we. I mean, we they, we invite them. They usually come and speak. All of them do. And the question always is, why don't you just leave us alone? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I mean, we we've only take the money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've only got four people in the House in Washington, D.C., as opposed to, say, a California or a Texas, yeah. who is, between those two states, probably 20% of the House. Yeah. So, so, I guess I'll ask this. The whole federal lands issue, right? Give us back our lands, all of that. Do you see anything ever going anywhere? Well, I hope so. Now, okay. Let me say it this way. I hope so. I'm convinced, from what I see from the money part, that we on the state could actually run it better. And I'll go right back to the question when they shut down our national parks on the shutdown. Uh, they were charging us, I'm trying to figure, figure $158,000 a day to keep the parks open that we paid out of state money. Mm -hmm. I took our staff and said, who do all this? And I said, tell me what it really should cost. They came back and said, checking all the federal, taking the benefit of every doubt, it should only cost 114. I said, quite frankly, we could do it cheaper than that and better than that because of how they have so many perks and benefits and all that type of stuff in the program. So when people say, and, and we see this problem right now, the federal does not have the money to really upkeep and run their parks as they say they should. If the state of Utah were to take them over, I'm convinced that we could generate enough money from them to handle them that we could more than keep the pristine nature that we're talking about and take care of and have control of them. The other thing that bothers me is I understand there was a company working on oil uh, drilling out in the basin. Eight years to finally get a permit to, to drill some wells out there. President Obama was elected. He got a new Secretary of Interior, uh, Secretary Salazar. My understanding is he just cut them off. You're done. Can't drill them. And I figured out, I'm with staff, and said, how much does that mean to the state of Utah? They figured if just the revenue from the, the severance tax, based on whatever else is raising, it meant $100 million up to Utah a year. You know, how far that A year. A, a year. $100 million a year. And that doesn't count property tax and all the other things, or salaries paid. That's just the severance. Yeah. Not the wages or income right. or whatever. What that would do for public education in the state of Utah. Could we actually generate the infrastructure and everything to run all that? I mean, we. Like you say, we could save money running the parks, but we bet we'd be paying the rangers less and having more 29-hour-a-week people and... Well, maybe or maybe not. I yeah. think part of the problem is that when you have federal employees, they have prevailing wages. And so they usually get paid higher than the people doing the same job on a state level just because okay. of federal law. But I'm really convinced of this. We couldn't do any worse. <laughs> and, and so... People think I'm, I'm radical. I'm really not very radical, but I think as I've seen it, I think that uh, we could develop the infrastructure. I think we're more committed to our lands here in Utah than somebody back in Washington. 
Do you see that ever happening? Do you see us ever getting any of the land? No. I mean, it, it belongs to everybody, so everybody would have to give it up to Utah? Well, I say this. If it belongs to everybody, then by Jove, why don't you pay the property taxes we're missing? You could keep it all and let people come and hike on it. If you paid the same property tax as the federal government paid the state of Utah that a private owner would have if he had it, that would solve all of our funding problems. But they'll never do that. It's free to them, basically, other than PILT payments and some of the small things Or the they do. severance or whatever yeah. for oil or gas. Yeah. Interesting. When we come back, let's talk some more about education, higher education in K-12. through We got a few more minutes? Glad to. We'll be back on Community Roundtable talking with Senator Lyle Halyard. When we come back, we'll talk about education and we'll talk about higher education. Keep it tuned. We are back on Community Roundtable talking with Senator Lyle Halyard. When we left off talking about education or wanting to get into education, you know, the Envision Utah survey, the 50, 60,000 people, uh, why, and again, self-selected group and whatnot, and without quibbling over the, the parameters of the survey itself, but clearly widespread support for increased school funding. So what do you see the legislature doing upcoming for K through 12? This year was a pretty good year for K through 12. What do you see next year? L let me tell you the last couple of years were, but teachers didn't see it in the classroom because when we had the collapse of the, of the economy in 2008, we found out the weakness in our retirement program. So we took that under our wing and said, that's not right. We want to make sure our s retirement program is, is solvent. It had dropped from about 100% funded down to about 78% funded. We made some changes, but one change we did not make, we did not change current benefits of those in the system. And so to do that, we had to take most of the co salary compensation we funded, put it back in to fund the retirement. The retirement now is at 82%, well on its way, that within 20 years, it will be fully funded as we had committed to people. That means that if you're a school teacher and you've retired, or if you're a school teacher and you're gonna retire, or a highway patrolman or whatever, your retirement is guaranteed. You're gonna get what we promised to you. So that was an important factor in, in how we funded to get that done. Uh, we did fund them this year, but our problem always ends up to be we just don't have enough money. Uh, the governor, uh, Herbert, has a great idea and we're working on it. Let's grow the economy. And as we grow the economy, that'll naturally raise more tax revenues that come in. So that, that's really kind of the overall issue we go to. Do you think that's working? Because it seems like the number of kids grows quicker than the economy. First thing we fund every year is the growth in the students. So, for example, this year, they, t they haven't got the figure yet. They'll have it uh, really very soon. But they, we think it's going to cost about $60 million to fund just the growth at last year's cost. So that's the first thing we'll take out of the budget, is the $60 million to fund that growth. So we fund the growth every year. We haven't done the same thing in higher ed. Higher ed, and I really think we've made some mistakes in here, higher ed's being funded by salary, uh, by tuition increases. And that's a sad thing, because that's the same as a tax increase to these people, and, and it creates a burden on students. I would hope that students would be more focused on the fact of not borrowing money, of, you know, uh, trying to work and get through school. And it, it's length of period, it's not been a good choice. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think of Salt Lake Community College, 20 years ago, the public support was about 75% the cost of running this institution, and now it's closer to, what, 55? So and that, that burden falls all to the students. Yeah. So what, what do you see for higher ed then? Do you see trying to balance that out more and having the state pick up a greater portion? I think we're trying to focus a higher education more in performance pay, which for most educators give them heartburn, heart attacks, and screaming. But I, I think we need to look at the teachers who are really producing and, and getting kids out of higher education, the core ca classes, and, and that will mean there'll be a differentiation in pay. It's going to be a headache for presidents to administer it but I hope they can get people through quicker. You know, I, I, I'm not a good example, because I got through Utah State in three years. I got through law school in two and a half years. So I have a, a, law, a degree from Utah State, a degree from University of Utah, in what normally would take seven years, and I did it in five and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I, no debt. Well, our, most of our students here take six years or more for a community yeah. college degree because they're working, because they have families. So speaking selfishly, for performance funding for Salt Lake Community yeah. College, how would you measure that when our students take six years to finish and well, another three years to get their bachelor's if they transfer? Well, we look primarily at those who complete. 
their schools. Kids who come and just take classes and drop out, those that's what we really need to clean up on. They either need to come and complete or, or decide before they're coming what they're really going to do. Too many kids come, I don't know what I'm going to do, I guess I'll go to school for a quarter or two. And yeah, that's so terrible? <laughs> uh, it, if we're paying for it, that's part of the issue, it's part of the cost. Well, it still makes them better citizens, you could say. It might not get them a job, but it'll make them more informed citizens. Could do. Might make them better voters. <laughs> so we only got a few minutes left, and, and I could talk about higher education all the rest of the day. But, but here we are, you know, Salt Lake Community College. A lot of our students want to transfer, and yet we also have this huge contingency, uh, huge, huge, huge portion of our students, I guess I should say, that are career and technical, so an AAS degree or a certificate. And I wonder what you see the legislature you're doing um, ahead in that because over the past few years that that CTE side has seems to have garnered a lot of support up it, on the hill. It has. There's a lot of feeling in, in the legislature that if we can get kids working you don't have to be a lawyer, you don't have to be a CPA. Uh, there's really good uh, mechanics, there's really good uh, people who, that we need in society who can do that and if they do it right can make, uh, make a decent living. And so I think we've, we've had too many kids who, who get out into a program they really don't want, they're being forced by their parents, or something they'd really rather do. And I think our decision up there is to get this training so they can go out and get jobs. We're told that for most of these kids who graduate with these associate degrees, there's jobs waiting for them. Oh, Whereas yeah. we get kids graduating from college with, a, say, a degree in sociology, they don't have a job for them. Unless it's the same one the kid just got from the associate degree. Well, yeah, you probably make eighty grand being a car mechanic, <laughs> and probably, sadly, not as a social worker in healthcare. So we've only got a couple minutes left, and I could ask you a thousand more questions. But what what do you see yourself sponsoring next spring, next winter in the session? What's well, on your plate? Oh, let me, let me tell you. I know for sure it's the budget. That okay. takes about one hundred and ten percent of my time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but I'm also uh, I've been involved in a study group with the courts. Okay. about how to get people out of jail quicker who have not been convicted of a crime. I heard a statistic that 62% of our people in jail in America have not been convicted of a crime. They're persons who've been arrested and taken in. They can't post the high can't bond. Can't post bail, yeah. They can't get out. And so we're working on a program that would have a better risk assessment so that these kids, these people can get out and go working. Because if you're in jail very long, you lose your job, lose your family, and even though you may be found not guilty, you paid a price. It's too late. So the courts have really picked up okay. this agenda, and I'm, I'm glad to work with them it on that. It seems a very bipartisan issue, too, it these is. days, nationally yeah. and locally. So last minute, any, any predictions for a president for the Senate race in Utah? Any, yeah. Anyone go out on a limb? What for the United States happen? president? Yeah. Boy, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I like Marco Rubio. I like. Uh, 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 I like. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Got so There's many. So names. many of them. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> well, Rubio, interesting. A fan of Trump or not? You know, I like uh, what Trump has said, but I think it's not well thought through. That's what <laughs> I think. Sometimes when you say things, you have to be careful of the of the comp. Uh, going to happen. I forgot Ben Carson. I, Carson, I, I, okay. For yourself in the Senate, Governor Hilliard, any of that? <laughs> no, no. You're happy I, in the Senate? I'm happy in the Senate. And you seem to have a fairly powerful chair there. Well, uh, I've worked hard to get it. And I think you have to do it on being fair to everyone. I, I think the Democrats and the other Republicans would say I've been fair. Great. Going to have to leave it there. Thank okay. you. Senator Lyle Hilliard joined us today on Community Roundtable, and thank you for being with us as well. If you have a comment, maybe you have a question, maybe you have an idea for a future show, get in touch, roundtable at slcctv.com. And don't forget, you can watch all our episodes archived online at slcctv.com. I'm Nick Burns, and hey, keep it tuned, slcctv.com.